Okay. Hey, Lauren here with uh, someone who doesn't necessarily need an introduction, but we'll give him one anyway. The Slash. How's it mm. going? I have there's coffee. Um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, just uh, hanging out. So as somebody who's like used to always being either on tour or in the studio, how have you been handling all of the downtime since the pandemic started? Um, I just, you know, as soon as I realized that there was no real end in sight, I just put got my nose to the grindstone, grindstone and started working. Um, you know, there was a million things going on that I, I could do. And there was Guns N' Roses material to work on. There was the Conspirators record to look forward to. Um, I did a bunch of outside sessions. I produced a movie. I did, a, you know, a bunch of stuff. I had to because otherwise, I don't know if you know my history, but downtime does not work well with me. So <laughs> does not bode well. So now that you kind of have like found ways to keep yourself busy, do you think that going forward, you're like really looking forward to get back into that hustling type of routine? Or are you going to try to give yourself kind of more time to take breaks in the future? Oh, no, I have no intention of taking any kind of <laughs> breaks whatsoever. Um, we're on the road now through March, and then um, Guns goes out in uh, basically, I think it's June all the way through December. And then the conspirators get back together and do an international tour starting in, like, uh, I think, January. And then it just goes for as long as that goes. So now this is your fourth album with Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators. Yeah. When you look back to the early, at the late 2000s, I'm sorry, when you were making your first self-titled solo album and you did, I believe the first song you worked on with Miles was Starlight. Yeah. Did, was, you, did you see that the two of you like having a career lasting this long? Well, I think one of the reasons why I've lasted so long in this business is I never looked that far into the future. It's always about trying to achieve whatever it is you're trying to achieve right now in the moment. And if you did try and think about how what you needed to do to be able to succeed down the road, you would intimidate the shit out of yourself. You know? um, but with, with uh, Miles, when we first got together, um, you know, we just uh, basically put together a, a, a tour to support that first solo record. He signed on to be the singer. And then I met Brent and Todd and we started that band. I, it was just really, really fun at the time. There was like an automatic um, synergy that happened, like a, a chemistry that we instantaneously have. And that's really rare, you know? You're, you're lucky if you get that once in your life, let alone twice, right? So, so it just started from there and we, we had a blast touring. We all got along really well. And uh, it was during that time that I was like, well, I might as well just make a record with these guys, right? And so we made Apocalyptic Love and we've just been sort of doing that same thing all the way until 12 years later, here we are. I had no idea it's been this long until the end of uh, last year. And I realized that Apocalyptic Love came out 10 years ago. It sort of blew my mind. So it's really been a lot of fun and it's been, um, a, a really like crazy little journey you know but went by quick definitely went by quick so right, we'll talk about four a little bit you guys went down to nashville to record it so what was the decision behind that and do you think that that environment kind of like played into the sound and the overall effect of the album at all um well the decision to go to nashville was was um dave cobb's works dave cobb produced the record and he he asked me he goes do you have a particular studio in LA you want to do this at, or do you want to just come down to Nashville and do it in my studio? And he works out of this, this legendary studio called RCA uh, Studio A, which um, has this, this amazing uh, artistic history. You know, all the, all the, the artists that have worked there from Johnny Cash to Dolly Parton to fucking Elvis to Waylon Jennings to Charlie Pry. I mean, just like, all these amazing records and it's Chet Atkins studio too on top of it. So, so I was like, no, I don't have any particular studio in LA that I'm, yeah, let's go to Nashville. So that's, that's how that happened. And then once we were there, the room itself is great. It's this massive room. Um, and it's, it's one of the few rooms I've ever been in that size. That's not incredibly live. Like there's, you know, shit's not bouncing all over the walls, but it's not completely dead either. It's a really great sounding room. And, uh, we recorded the album live, you know, so we just set up like we would at a club, you know, mic'd it up and then just played the songs and captured the songs in the moment. 
and uh you know and kept the vocals and the guitar solo all the stuff that we normally overdub we kept all that intact and so that was really sort of um a revelation for me because i've always wanted to record in that fashion and no producer would ever let me do it so that was a, a big change on this record and dave cobb made that possible as well as this room in our at rca so it was a lot of fun we had a great time and I read that a lot of the songs are, I mean, at least some of them are from like previous tours from other album cycles. So how do you kind of like when you come down to sit and do a record, how do you pull out those specific songs that you want to turn into something this time around? Well, it wasn't from other, it was only from one album cycle. It was just the last album. And the way that we have been doing it is like, like we were talking about Apocalyptic Love, right? Um, it was during that first tour with Miles and the guys that I was like, well, okay, so we should do a record together. So I wrote the music on the tour and then we went in the studio and made Apocalypse. And we've followed that pattern ever since. So half the songs on this record were written during the Living the Dream tour. And we had, had the pandemic not happened, we would have put the record out a long time ago. Yeah. But um, anyway, so I, I just always write during the tour for this band because I'm always in that, this, you know, when we're touring together, I'm in that mode. And so uh, that's how that works. But I also wrote a bunch of music during the pandemic, like a ton of music during the pandemic. And I just, uh, I decided to take some of those songs and put it on this record because they were, they were pandemic inspired. So I wanted them, they were fresh and about that particular kind of subject at the time. So that's how we picked the other songs. One of the really cool ones that I want to talk about specifically that I, I think it stands out a lot is Spirit Love. Can you kind of talk about how that one came about? Because it has like a Middle Eastern vibe to it almost. Um, uh, it was it was it was uh, definitely born out of his sort of the frustration of being in lockdown. So they had a, a little bit of a sort of sleazy punk rock vibe to it of just like sort of giving the finger to the situation right um but the middle eastern part just came i mean i think i i wrote the uh i wrote the main part of the song first and i think that has certain chord changes that lend itself to an almost mid middle eastern vibe and then when i did the intro i really dug in in that theme and came up with that that intro part i don't know i was just sitting around the studio when i did it do you, this is a question that's kind of inspired by something I heard Jerry Cantrell say. He said that no matter how much success you've had in the past, sometimes you still will feel like pressure when you go to write down, write new music. Do you kind of relate to that or do you not feel any sense of pressure? Um, well, you know, that's, I, <laughs> I never really verbally get into all that stuff, but I mean, you know, you, I think there's a pressure that you put on yourself to just do something that you like. And, and also you have to find uh, sort of inspiration, you know, so that you feel like, okay, I want to create something and there's that flow. Um, and that's, that's a kind of pressure unto itself because that's not happening 24 seven, you know, there's moments you pick up the guitar and there's nothing, you know, fucking tumbleweeds, <laughs> uh, you know, so there's that pressure. But as far as success is concerned, um, I, I pretty much stayed in the trenches, no matter how big anything, you know, like, let's say as a good, greatest example is where Guns N' Roses got. Um, I always like to stay down in sort of the club level and, and kick around down there and still have to sort of prove myself at curb level, <laughs> you know, and that's always stuck with me. So I like to, you know, I, I always feel pretty humbled about, by you know, what it, all of the other musicians and everything. And, and I, I, I never have felt that lofty, you know what I mean? So. That was going to kind of be my next question. So you guys are starting your tour tonight in Portland and yeah. with Miles and the conspirators, you guys play, you know, theaters, clubs. Does that kind of take you back to the days of when you were first starting out as a live musician before you were playing stadiums and everything? Um, I mean, I, like I said, I've kept that going, uh, you know, ever since guns got that big, I've always had something going on where I was still jamming down at street level. So it's just, I like to be at, at that place. I mean, I love being able to connect with, 
you know, 30,000 to 100,000 people. It's an amazing feeling. But I, I still feel like to feel that grounded feeling of being in the club and sharing the space with an audience where you're toe to toe. And so I've always kept that going. And I, I really appreciate having the options to be able to do that. Now, which younger bands do you see and are a fan of that you think are kind of going to be like the future of rock and roll? Uh, <laughs> well, OK, so I mean, right now there's a there's a great sort of undercurrent of rock and roll happening with a lot of young bands. I don't know who's going to be the savior of rock. I, I don't want to go there. But, um, you know, there's there's obviously it's great to see bands like Dirty Honey and Joyous Wolf getting some airplay and getting some recognition. And that's cool. I mean, they we played with those guys uh, back in in 2018 and 2019. And uh, so that's that's really cool. And I think they've got some great songs. Um, and there's a there's a bunch of other bands that are uh, there's one sort of Swedish punk rock, punk rock type band um, called uh, the Viagra Boys. And I think they're Swedish who are awesome. But there's a little bit more punk rock than sort of just your average hard rock band. But I think those guys are brilliant. And there's some other, you know, young bands out there. But there's. Uh, you know, like my son's a drummer in a band. He's turned me on to this whole network of like really down to earth, gritty rock and roll bands that he's aware of and turned me on to. And so there's like a real uh, movement happening that's below the radar, you know, um, it's not mainstream, but it's massive. So I'm excited to see what that turns into. And now that you've taken some of these like aforementioned rising bands out and you're kind of that like hero role model to them. Do you remember what it was like when you were out on tour, like opening for your heroes? And how does it kind of feel knowing that you're that model for them now? I never actually thought of myself as that model, but um, uh, I just, I, I've, you know, some of my favorite memories, um, touring memories, especially are, you know, as a young band opening up for like Alice Cooper and Aerosmith and, you know, and, and, uh, the cult right you know back in the day um i mean that was that's great because you're just sort of like um you know you might be the king of your neighborhood while you're a fucking local band and you manage to become a weekend headliner and all that but when you get out into the world and start touring it's such a great experience your first time around and you're arrogant and you just get kicked around a little bit because you don't know you know you think you know everything but you don't um you know so it's 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 a lot of fun so i i would imagine any of the bands that have been opening up say for guns and roses that are like young and i mean i'm hoping that they're having as great an experience as i did doing the same thing and so there's the recent news is the rock and roll hall of fame nominations given that you've already been inducted it seems yeah. like the artists who aren't always considered mainstream rock um it seems to stir up a little bit of controversy within the rock community whether they think that they deserve to get in or not what is your concept of genres and labels and what does it mean to you to be a rock and roll artist uh to be a rock and roll artist i mean Okay, I mean, just real quick on that one. I mean, that's that's like my lifeblood. That's I was born into it. I've I was raised with it, and it's just it's an attitude and a, a way of thinking and a, a, a kind of um, freedom and freedom of expression, freedom of a lot of different things that I just subscribed to really, really early on. And I couldn't imagine living any other way. Um, so that's, it, it means everything to me. Um, but as far as uh, the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has become this big mythical thing, right? It doesn't really mean anything, but somehow they made it seem like it does, you know? And so we all sort of like, oh, we're gonna be part of this thing that's just an imaginary, status thing i guess um but i think genres in in terms of that when you say rock and roll hall of fame i do get a little weirded out when i see a lot of hip-hop in there because it's like I, you know uh i don't get I get that necessarily i had a great conversation with keith richards about that one time at the rock and roll hall of fame i forgot who it was that was up there and he was like well i don't get the hippity hoppity <laughs> It's quote unquote, it was classic Keith Richards, right? 
And and I and I understood where it was coming from because there's some legendary artists in that genre, but how they relate to rock and roll sometimes I just don't see the connection. Um, but it is it is what it is, and it is controversial. But I don't think people should get so bent out of shape because it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people and, say it should just be called the Music Hall of Fame, but I well, I mean, you know, they might be right because it starts to broad the it, it starts to get so broad that it loses its definition. For sure. And there's a lot of artists who should have been in there a long time ago, like priests. They should have been in there a yeah, years it's, ago. It's a little bit like the magazine, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, all over the place and ill-defined. So last one, we're going to end on this one. Um, recently saw said that you don't really read other biographies. Yeah. And do you think that you'd ever write another book to follow up your 2007 one? Um, I don't have any intentions of, of writing another book. I, I was really sort of goaded into writing that first one because of a situation, well, a bunch of stuff that was going around at the time that I wanted to sort of set straight. And I used the book as a vehicle to be able to talk about those things. And it was it was kind of cathartic at the time. I'd just gotten sober and, and had a, a sort of a little bit more clarity <laughs> than I'd had leading up to that. But uh, I don't see any real reason to write another one, although it has been very interesting since that last book. Um, but as far as reading other people's uh, uh, biographies or autobiographies, um, they're sort of they're sort of weird because they seem almost intrusive. You know, especially if you know that person, it almost seems like spying. You know? <laughs> but then, so I mean. Uh, autobiographies are, are one thing, but actual biographies that were written by somebody else are usually, for the most part, um, very loosely based in fact. So I just sort of avoid them. I think I learned that when I, I read No One Here Gets Out Alive from Dan Sugarman, That's who I had issue with myself uh, later in life. God bless him. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, and then also, I think Hammer of the Gods. And then at, at that point, I was like, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's that's sort of like uh this kind of uh an, again a sort of mythical proposition you know where you're talking about the antics of 24 7 life in a rock and roll band somebody that you actually don't know that well all righty awesome well thank you so much for your time today it was great getting a chat with you and um i'm sure i'll be seeing you out on the road a couple times yeah later. yeah no it was good talking to you and i'm really honored to be on your wall of fame <laughs> <laughs> all right have a great day all right have a good one cheers